All right, thanks for joining. Welcome to Water is Life. Um, this is called the Lessons from Bermuda. This is the first of our four webinars. So I am Doreen Duncan. For those of you who are not familiar with Island City Lab, I'm one of the co-founders of Island City Lab. Um, we are a Jamaica-based urban think tank dedicated to understanding the unique features and challenges of small island cities here in the Caribbean. Our aim is really to improve our built environment um, by building, fostering, and convening a network of civic thinkers to confront these challenges. So for the What is Life series, this is the first of um, four webinars in the series, we are tackling what we think is the most critical challenge facing island cities right now, which is preparing for and adapting to climate change. So I'm assuming some of you might know, some of you might not be familiar, but the recent IPCC report, so that's the International Panel on Climate Change, projected for the Caribbean itself, declining rainfall, more severe droughts, and more intense hurricane seasons. So what that told us is that water security is perhaps the defining issue for all of our Caribbean islands. And in each of these webinars, we are hoping to explore the scale of the problem and identify locally relevant solutions that can really help us to deal with our new climate um, reality. So today in this webinar, Lessons from Bermuda, we're gonna be exploring how another Caribbean island pursues water security through rainwater harvesting policies and practices and designs. And we're gonna engage in a discussion around how feasible that solution is for Jamaica and by and large other Caribbean islands. So with that said, I want to quickly introduce our speakers who are joining us today. Um, their full bio can be found on our social media. But we first we have Dr. Shanika Lester. She is a human geography lecturer in the Department of Geography and Geology at the University of West Indies in Jamaica. Her research interests lie in freshwater ecosystems, water security, and nexus approaches to sustainable development. We also have Omar Wright. He's a development practitioner who currently serves as a program lead for environment and community development programs at the Jamaica National Foundation. There he's championing a five-year environmental sustainability program across the Jamaica National Group, focusing on things like water conservation, energy efficiency, waste management, and reforestation. And last but certainly not least is our island guest today is Sean Lavis. He's a hydro, hydrogeologist from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources for the government of Bermuda. Um, the department has an overarching mandate to protect Bermuda's environment and, responsibility, and responsibly manage its natural resources, which of course includes water. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna hand it over to Sean, who's gonna introduce us to Bermuda and tell us a little bit more about Bermuda's water resource context. Also, feel free to start adding questions as Sean is pre presenting. Feel free to drop them in the chat. Okay, thank you very much, Doreen. Um, and thank you to um, Island City Labs for um, inviting me to uh, talk in this webinar. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, so thank you. Um, yeah, so as um, um, uh, Dwayne mentioned, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of um, the rainwater harvesting in Bermuda. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so first, a little bit more about um, my department. It's a very diverse department. Um, in addition to these um, two pieces of legislation that my section works under, the, the Clean Air Act and the Water Resources Act. There's um, a whole a wealth of other legislation covering um, uh, protected species, um, be it animal or plant. Um, there's lots of research projects that um, are undertake, undertaken by the department along with um, management of um, Ramsar sites and other sites of um, ecological significance. Um, I'm a hydrogeologist, so my main role is um, uh, to uh, manage the freshwater lenses, which I'll touch a little bit on this on, on, on in this um, presentation. Um, management of those and response and regulation of polluters, so that could be our um, electricity provider or um, uh, people who uh, um, uh, bring bring oil to the island and things like that. Um, okay, ne next slide, please. Um, Bermuda's freshwater resources. We don't have, we don't have any uh, uh, rivers or lakes or anything like that. 
Um, we have very permeable limestone, so the rain that falls on it um, percolates through it very quickly um, all the way down to uh, the, the water table. So um, we, we, we can't use any surface water as a, as a, as a freshwater resource. Fortunately, we're blessed with very high uh, rainfall um, in the order of uh, 1500 millimeters a year or so. Um, and so uh, we, given, given that we have all that rain, that's, that, that's, that's our, our main source of uh, fresh water. So uh, next, next slide, please. Yeah, so here's it broken down into um, uh, the three main areas. So uh, rain, rainwater harvesting, um, and I'll talk about that a bit more. That's essentially catching the rain on your roof and diverting that rain into a tank uh, that's usually underneath the house. So a rough estimate um, uh, of the percentage that contributes to our fresh water is around 60%. These, this is a very rough estimate. Um, uh, many, many people on the island, in addition to capturing water, also have a, a well, which they use for things like uh, flushing toilets mainly, but it, it's also used for laundry and irrigation. Um, and we don't, we, we can't measure what they take uh, uh, in a year. So um, there's, there's a big error on this, but, but it's a significant proportion, nonetheless, coming from rainwater harvesting. Uh, rainwater itself isn't quite enough to um, supply uh, sufficient water for our needs. So um, it's topped up with uh, reverse osmosis. So that's taking something like seawater um, and processing that to fresh water that comes in around 24%. And um, from our fresh water lenses at the moment, we're producing around 16%, again, via typically by reverse osmosis. Next slide, please. Um, so we have fresh water lenses. Um, so I'd really like to have a few more slides actually to go through these. These are essentially sort of like uh, icebergs kind of floating on water. So this, this is all in rock. But if you, if you were standing on Bermuda and you drove down, you'd eventually hit the, the water table. And that's at the same elevation as the sea. So essentially the sea is, the, the saline water goes underneath Bermuda, Bermudian rocks and at the other side. So all the pore spaces within the rock are filled with saline water. When it rains, the rain percolates down into the uh, uh, water table. And because, it, because of the rock is there, it can't escape quickly enough. So over time it builds up and it forms lenses. Um, and we refer to them as freshwater lenses. They're, they're sort of more of a mixture. You have uh, lower salinity water towards the water table, but as you go deeper, it gets progressively more saline until you reach um, the salinity of seawater. So we have um, a few of these, these um, lenses. The main one is in the, in the center uh, of, of Bermuda. That's the central lens. And that's, that's the one that produces most of the uh, groundwater by reverse osmosis. We also have a smaller lens uh, in the sort of north uh, east of the island up at St George's uh, and, and several smaller lenses extending along the, uh, the uh, curving arm that, uh, to, in, in the southwest of uh, Bermuda. So anyone that has any questions on that, now might be a good time to pause in case there are any questions on the lenses. Okay, so we move to the next slide, please. So this is a, um, a schematic of uh, our, our freshwater resources. Um, so we can see a bit more here. We have uh, the, the, the land. So this is all in rock. Um, and then we have a lens that extends to, to, towards the, uh, the coastline where it um, then discharges into the ocean. Um, so we have, um, where should we start? We start with rainwater. So yeah. As before, about 60% from the rain that falls on our roofs and is diverted into tanks by the house. Um, the, the water that's used there, um, it ends up essentially in cesspits. Uh, we have very few um, sewer lines. So most of the water that, that rains on the house goes in the tank. People use it and then end, comes, ends up going back into the, uh, into the lens as a kind of artificial recharge. Um, to make up the um, water, uh, we have um, uh, deeper wells taking the salty water um, and producing that to um, fresh water and, and also taking 16% uh, 
or, or making 16% of our needs from, um, from the lens itself. Um, yeah. Uh, when the, one of the main benefits of this actually is um, ordinarily when, when rain falls on, on the land, it, a lot of it is lost by um, a process called evapotranspiration where it um, basically vaporizes and, and ends up back in the atmosphere. But because um, we capture that water very quickly on the roof um, and consume it within the house and, and, and go down the cesspit, we, we, we lose very little water to, to evapotranspiration. So um, it's, um, it's, it's a good system to maintain uh, the, the, the lenses. The only trouble is, um, obviously, if you're getting recharged from the cesspit, uh, you, you contaminate the groundwater. So we, we have high levels of nitrate, which means we can't drink the groundwater directly. It has to be processed. And, that, and that's by law as well. You're not allowed to drink the, uh, the water from the groundwater without it being processed. OK, next slide, please. Um, so uh, given the importance of rainwater harvesting um, for, for a long time now, since about 1951, um, it's been law that all buildings um, have to capture water. So the law states that you need to have, uh, and this is, sorry, this is the Public Health Water Storage Regulations, 1951. Um, uh, so it stipulates that uh, you need at least 80% or more of the roof to be uh, gutted um, to collect rainwater. Um, and, and also stipulates the size of the tank uh, that you need in order to um, uh, store about three months of water, um, essentially. Um, and in there as well, there are also recommendations about how to treat your tank water, because one of the issues that uh, we have found, and I'll talk about this more in the next slide, is that um, with things like bird droppings, lizards, leaves, get on the roof, and these uh, wash into the tank. So. Um, it's important to maintain the tank to make sure that it doesn't get um, a lot of bacteria. And also at the bottom of the tank, you build up this kind of sludge area. Um, and that's, that, that's, that, that's not good, it's particularly during drought times when the water in your tank is very low. Um, you, can, you can end up disturbing the sediment and, and, and bringing it through into your house. So um, yeah, maintenance is important. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, the rainwater that comes here is, is, is as, you, as you'd expect, it's, 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 very, um, it's very clean. Um, although uh, one, one issue that sprung up in the last week or so for us is the, uh, the issue of forever chemicals, um, uh, PFAS chemicals. And um, yeah, we're, we're, we're thinking about how to respond to that. Um, it's gonna require some expensive um, um, laboratory analysis. Um, so uh, that's a bit of an unknown, but but essentially the water is pretty pure as it as it rains down. But as I described before, um, bird droppings and the like um, wash end up washed into the tank, and uh, we we don't we don't systematically test tanks, and the government doesn't go around uh, uh, regulating the quality of people's water. There are recommendations about um, uh, how to how to treat the water, essentially adding. Um, uh, adding uh, 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 um, bleach uh, perox to your to your tank water um, every couple of weeks or every few months, but not 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 many people do. I don't I don't know many people who um, are really fussy about keeping their tanks clean. Um, and lots of people drink the water. They use a Brita filter or some filter underneath the in, in, in some filter in the kitchen to, to process the water before they drink it. Um, but yeah, when we, typically when we find, as in, like in the 2013 study, um, we find that you know, the, va uh, the vast majority of tanks that we do have a look at uh, have um, bacterial contaminations above um, well, uh, the standard. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, the, um, the, the, the wonderful Bermuda roof, this is the, uh, the main way that the, the water is harvested and um, the, the main driver to, to help us um, be sustainable with respect to water consumption. Um, so the roofs are a bit of a Bermudian kind of look um, and uh, uh, all planning applications have to um, conform with the, 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 the Bermuda image. So we have these um, tiled 
uh, roofs. So you can see that how it's stepped. These are these are slabs of limestone uh, um, from Bermuda. Um, I think they're about a foot by eight inches or something like that, and a couple of inches thick. Um, and they're laid on top of each other, held in place with, uh, with cement. And then they're sealed with um, uh, different kinds of paints. Um, uh, over time, you put up a thick layer of paint on top of them, and um, it makes the mixer is very, very strong, um, pretty good in hurricanes. But also, um, you could, you might be able to see. I can't use my cursor, unfortunately. But you might be able to see on the roof above the uh, the, the circular window. You, you can see one of the gutters. So the the rain falls on there, and then it's diverted to usually two pipes um, via these gutters. Um, yep. Oh yeah. Well, 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 another thing about these, um, you find uh, over couple of years maybe the um a, a, you, you accumulate dust from the atmosphere cars and the like and the, the beautiful white roofs start to look a bit gray and and, and grubby so uh, uh you you have to um, maintain the roof as well which involves uh either just bleaching it and cleaning it or bleaching it cleaning it and then repainting um so there's that aspect of maintenance as well uh next slide please Okay, so um, about the opportunities of um, rainwater harvesting. Um, so this is sort of like the uh, the benefits of uh, of collecting the the, uh, the rainwater. So one of them, and this isn't a major. This is sort of a, a side benefit, really. Um, collecting the, the water on the roof and storing in a tank does does help to reduce surface runoff during sort of storms. Um, um, but it, but the main thing is increasing the recharge to the groundwater lenses. Um, it's a very effective way of uh, getting water into the into the into the lenses. Um, the, what, what I think is one of the main benefits of um, uh, uh, the uh, capturing the water is um, there's very little energy required for you to uh, uh, get that water and, and, and use it. It's, there's a there's a there's a small pump. Um, and, that, and that's about it. Uh, so um, yeah, that's uh, for fa it's fantastic for that reason. Um, also, we have um, I said we don't get we don't get any water bills. Some people can connect. There are two two um, organisations that provide possible water by by pipes, but they um, there's a very small percentage. I think it's something around like fifteen percent of the population or something that's connected to it. Um, so most of us uh, don't. Get don't get bills. All we have to do is manage the tank every uh, uh, every now and then, and um, uh, clean the roofs um, every two, three years, something like that. And this is great because it forces, especially me, I'm kind of cheap, so um, it forces me to keep an eye on how much water is being consumed. Um, so Bermudians um, do tend to consume per person uh, as a smaller amount of water than what you might be considered sort of global average. Um, and that's because we're always aware of how much water's in the tank. Whenever we're showering, brushing teeth, that sort of thing, um, we're very careful not to let the water go, um, which I think is also um, is, um, important if you uh, want to maintain um, sus sus sustainable water supply. Okay, next slide, please. So th there are some challenges with the um, um, rainwater harvesting. So the bacteria is one of the main ones. Now, I've, I've lived here for about four years and um, I've been ill a couple of times, probably from the water, but um, it's pretty rare. Um, I think your, your gut bacteria must respond or something like that. Um, so, but but it, is a, it is an issue that you have to um, be aware of and, and um, yeah, respond to when necessary. Um, the, the other thing is not, it doesn't provide, uh, well, most people that I know the, the, who, who have rainwater harvesting, they, they, they can pretty much sustain themselves just from that water. But there are other people, especially if they've got things like swimming pools, um, that the uh, rainwater harvesting just isn't enough. And also some of these old houses um, have quite small tanks, but um, yeah, but for uh, a lot of people, it's, it's not quite enough. So they have to top up. And we, to top up the, the water tank, we use uh, truckers, they're called truckers. 
a big water um, tanks that fill up from one of the two organizations that provide potable water via reverse osmosis. And then you pay about $125 per thousand gallons for them to come in and pump that into your, um, into your water tank. So um, yeah, but, the, but like I said before, the, the other thing that you can do is use a well uh, to um, provide water for flushing flushing toilets. And um, that would bring most people up to around 100% of their water needs. Um, okay, so we've gone over, um, oh, the other, yeah. So in addition to bacteria, um, there's been some concerns, especially especially near our power plant, about contaminants from from, at, from atmospheric fallout, from, from combustion. So we have uh, uh, our electricity is um, essentially 100% from, um, a, uh, um, a plant that burns heavy fuel oil uh, and the uh, exhausts come out the stack um, and then they're carried that, that the, the exhaust plume is then carried over people's houses and they're concerned about contaminants falling out of that plume and getting into their water so we do periodic testing for contaminants and we've generally found that they're below Oh, I'm over time. Okay, I need to speed up. <laughs> um, I was worried I'd be too too short. Um, yeah, so we carry out periodic testing for contaminants, but we haven't found any evidence that it exceeds drinkable standards. They tend to be indicative of uh, a car, of sort of chemical signature, but not at really high concentrations. We also have uh, the forever chemicals. Like I said before, we don't fully understand that at the moment. Um, Droughts can be in, can impact us. We've had a drought here for a few months now, and um, yeah, when people are ordering water, it's hard to get hold of a water truck. You have to wait a few days. Um, and the last one is uh, oh yeah, well I've covered the um, emitting atmospheric. I don't need to go for that last point. I think we've covered that. So that's the last slide, I believe, isn't it? Thank you, thank you so much for that, John. <laughs> I think it's You're it's welcome. it's a it's a helpful overview of another country's water system, which is very, very different than Jamaica's water system. And I think it's a helpful comparison before we start and you know, get into this conversation. Um, so before you know, I bring on Omar and Shanika to start discussing you know, the relevance of that type of system for Jamaica, I want to give them a chance to kind of introduce themselves, their work, but particularly their interests slash passions around water security. Um, so we can go ahead and start with Shanika. Hi, good afternoon again, everyone. So my work with water surrounds both water security and water governance. And through that work, I have explored the social, economic and political dimensions of water security at the household level within Kingston, looking at inequalities in access within and between communities of different socioeconomic backgrounds, as well as diving into how access is mediated by those in control of the resource itself. I also examine our institutional framework and how management action shape water security or insecurity in Jamaica and what are some of the steps that needs to be taken in order for us to secure a more um, sustainable future where our water resources is concerned. Um, one of the highlights from that work is definitely while all of us is at threat um, for water insecurity, the urban poor and those that are within areas that they do not have sustainable and reliable access. So um, are some of the most vulnerable amongst us. So within our urban areas, we have high pipe water coverage, meaning that these people might have water pipe on their premises, but oftentimes that supply is not reliable and it is not sufficient. And so we cannot call that water security. So that's it in a nutshell. So I appreciate you bringing in the kind of socioeconomic issues around water security that you can have piped water, but the cost, the availability, the frequency, yes. the quality is also a question of equity, right? So yeah. Omar, over to you. Uh, thanks, Doreen. And let me just first say good 
afternoon, evening, um, wherever you are joining us from. I am aware that we might be having um, participants from around the world. So good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're joining us. From. And thank you to Alman Sikula for this opportunity for us to have a discussion um, what is life. And under the water project that the Jamaica National Foundation executed, we have a phrase to say, climate is water, because how we are going to see the effects of climate change, especially for small island developing states, is through uh, the impacts of water, whether that is sea level rise, whether that is sailing intrusion in our know, water sources, whether that is droughts when we don't have water, or whether that is flooding when we have too much water. Um, but what has been my um, work and role in um, this whole issue of water security? Well, the Jamaica National Foundation, one of the leading providers for um, mortgages in Jamaica, um, we focus on the housing sector. In 2017, we sat down to look at what are some of the things were, that was affecting homeowners. And um, Shanika just spoke to it. So we might have uh, pipe water. Um, I think it's 70 going to 80% of the homes in Jamaica have access to pipe water, um, pipe water. But sometimes that access is not real access. And so right. we, are, we are seeing a whole lot of management issues around water. We are seeing a whole lot of um, issues with using water efficiently. And so in 2017, we developed a project with the Inter-American Development Bank to look at how we might uh, encourage homeowners, householders, developers, when they're actually building homes, to take into consideration um, questions around efficiency. So what are the types of technologies that you're using to ensure that you're using the water when you do have it in an efficient way? Questions around uh, around resiliency. So um, for the Jamaicans who are on the call, we will recall like earlier in this year, we had um, industrial action by the NWC. And so water, as we would come to know it, was not in abundance. Even though we're the land of wood and water, we didn't have water for quite some time. So how do we encourage homeowners, encourage Jamaicans to have uh, storage capacity built up? And one of the technologies that we encourage at the Jamaica National Foundation is um, rainwater harvesting. And yes, um, Jamaicans do practice rainwater harvesting, but I, I heard Sean make mention to the, the situation of bacteria. Uh, and so how do we store the water safely? The health considerations um, around um, rainwater harvesting. So I, what we did um, with the project, so it started in 2017, we ended um, last year. We brought together um, research. So we literally went into Jamaican homes um, and we install these efficient devices that we would have we would have been aware of um, that were on the market just to see how it might impact upon the behaviors one, um, the conservation, water conservation behaviors in households and how it would affect their um, water bills. I saw Sean had it in there uh, in his presentation as well, how, how using water in an efficient way um, impacts on, on the water bills. So the pilot rolled out in 2020 and we had nine households um, in the urban era. Um, and what we saw was that actually when persons um, are sensitized to how they can use water in a more efficient way, um, augmented by the technologies, it redounds to them conserving water as well as savings on their water bills upwards of 30%. And so we are now in the, in the process of uh, disseminating that information um, to the regular um, public, to every Jamaican, to let them know that there are things that you can do that not only protects the climate and protects us as a small island developing space, but it also puts money back into your pocket. So that I wanted to I wanted to tack onto one of the things you just said. Well. So you talked about behavior, and I think it's a very interesting topic, right? So Jamaica, for all the Jamaicans on the call, Jamaica, the indigenous word means land of wood and water, right? So we obviously have a, a very different perception of water. And I'm, I'm, I'm throwing in a new question here. What are the, the, the attitudes towards water in Jamaica versus Bermuda? And I want, I want you to start off, Sean. What, what are the attitudes around water? And then we kick it to the Jamaicans on the call. It's, but it, it's, it's always on our, it's always on our mind. Um, the amount of water so we, we even have terms of different kinds of rain like um so tank water tank rain this tank rain is different to, to normal rain normal rain lands on your roof it evaporates a bit it makes the roof wet and it doesn't go anywhere but then tank rain when it rains outside people usually say it's tank rain so you know it's good so it's 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 on our minds almost constantly um i've got two kids 
uh, one of them in particular likes to, to have a shower, a long shower. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's just a case of um, managing the behavior of children to make sure that, you know, when they're brushing their teeth, you turn off the water. Um, I won't talk too much about the toilets, but you know, you don't, you don't have to flush every time. <laughs> um, quick showers, just, um, yeah, you're just aware. Other people as well, have um, great water collection systems. So they've uh, retrofitted um, li little tanks outside to collect the water from um, the kitchen sink or the or the bathroom, and they use that for irrigation. Um, it's yeah, it's just it's, it's something that you have to actively manage every day and and and, and um, be aware of. Janika Omar. I think that's the opposite here in Jamaica. I do believe that in recent years, you have more Jamaicans being aware uh, that we are in a water crisis. However, those efforts of water conservation and water use efficiency is usually confined to those periods of low rainfall or drought. So the general, the general value for water is still pretty low. The resource might be seen as a tragedy of the commons, right? Everybody thinks that it's infinite. They'll always have it. They have a right to it and they will use it however they please. I don't believe that there is an understanding and an awareness of where exactly does our water come from beyond the pipe, of course, or the National Water Commission. A lot of people do not know the importance of our freshwater ecosystems or watersheds or rivers or aquifers and the value of the service that they provide to us. So I think generally in Jamaica, we think that we have an abundance of water supply and the value for the resource is still very low. I agree. I agree. Uh, it, it it is we 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 have this thinking in Jamaica that we have an abundance of water because we're the land of wood and water, and therefore, um, psychologically, how we approach that question of water conservation is that we're we're always going to have water. We're not going to run out of it. But as Janika did say, um, we are now faced with questions of accessibility and we are faced with the shortages um, with our available, um, water availability. So you will find now that persons um, in those periods of time when water, there's a water lock off or the National Water Commission is sending out um, circulars to say, this weekend between this time and that time there will be no water so you find that persons that that is almost a nudge for persons now to consider water conservation and so we're we're, we're seeing the change not as uh, as rapidly as we'd like to see it but slowly persons are coming around to how important it is to conserve water and to use water efficiently i think that's a very helpful framing um so given that context of the way that Jamaicans in particular perceive water and the abundance of water that we have or do not have, um, is rainwater harvesting a relevant strategy to help us increase both the perception and the actual water security that we have? And if so, what are the steps? I mean, I know Omar, you had mentioned a couple from JN, but what are some of the steps that we've taken thus far to, to get rainwater harvesting to be you know, as, as widespread as it is in Bermuda? So, so yes, to answer your question directly, yes, um, it is a, it's a viable option to consider, but there are other considerations, especially coming out of a project, um, projectized environment where we actually went out and worked, we are trying even actively now to get persons to see rainwater harvest as a viable option. It depends on where in Jamaica they are located. So um, the concentration of um, uh, uh, Jamaicans, where most of the homes are located, you'll find Kingston, St. Andrew, and St. Catherine. Um, those, that area of the country is not the area that get the greatest level of rainwater, um, rainfall. So to have a rainwater harvesting system in a location that um, does not get the highest levels of rainfall, then that is defeating um, what we are trying to encourage. But on the other hand, to have it as a, a backup, the resilience, so that when you don't have access to the um, utility, the water utility, there is another source. We, we, we position the messaging around rainwater harvesting like that. But then you have the Western part of the island. So the Westmoreland, um, the Portland, 
those areas that would see increased um, uh, rainfall, that a rainwater harvesting solution in those areas would be appropriate because they would have appropriate supplies of rainwater to take care of their, um, their daily needs. Um, so it depends. Um, if it is that we're doing it in the um, in the parts of the island that does not see um, the levels of rainfall, we, we position it in in the the message to them is resilience. Um, for the other parts of the island, of course, resilience yes, but also um, it is it is a source for you to get water and you. You don't necessarily have to be connected to the water utility. That's savings for you. And I easily to say I just discovered that there's a community in Jamaica that does not have um, water from NWC for over 100 years. So mm -hmm. a rainwater harvesting solution for that community, it would be would be a viable option. So it depends. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shanika or Sean, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, I was going to add. Um, so this, they're not used as much as they used to be uh, in the past year. But in addition to uh, rainwater harvesting from houses, we have uh, a few. Um, they're essentially painted um, hills, sections sections of hills where they've cleaned all the soil off um, and um, used the same sort of white paint to make uh, large water catches um, from the hills. Uh, rather than, than just on the houses. So uh, that's another, I, I, that, that could be another option if you wanted to expand it. It wouldn't have to be on houses. If there's there's land that, that can be used to capture the rain as well, that's, that's another option. Okay. I just wanted to add to what Omar was saying. Rainwater harvesting has been a longstanding tradition in Jamaica. Many rural communities, that is the only source of water that they have known for decades. And so, yes, it is a relevant strategy. Also, our bimodal rainfall pattern provides us with the opportunity to catch rainwater. We have a maximum rainfall season within October, and then we have another in May, and the dry season in between that. And so persons can store water that they need to offset the shortfall in the dry season, um, in the wet season. And so our rainfall pattern affords us the opportunity to um, harvest rainwater. Um, as Omar mentioned, I think that probably 90% of our population lives within maybe 25 kilometers of our coastline. And so we find those densely populated areas like the Kingston metropolitan region having more people that lack um, reliable access to water supply. And, I, and rainwater harvesting can play a role in terms of filling that gap. What are we doing so far about it? I think as a country, we recognize that rainwater harvesting is a part of the solution. And so um, we see it's been incorporated in the 2019 water sector policy, where um, the policy promotes the incorporation of rainwater harvesting systems in the development process. Also, the policy speaks of a draft rainwater harvesting guidelines, which I think possibly should be um, drafted already. Um, if not, I, I hope that it will soon be drafted. And then we have the provisions for regulations in the 2018 Building Act, where the act speaks to the minister being able to make regulations for rainwater harvesting. And we see in the 2017 development order for Kingston and St. Andrew and the Pedro Keys, where rainwater harvesting is encouraged and that is outlined how um, to go about it. So I think we're moving in the right direction as a country and the foundation is laid. However, rainwater harvesting is still something that is voluntary. And I don't think that we'll get to where we need to go, which is a water secure future, if it's still voluntary. 
I think that's an extremely helpful point. So you mentioned and you talked about the policies that we currently have, the suggestions, the recommendations, that it would be nice if um, you do these sorts of things. But you, you, you talk very strongly about the, the need for regulation, that it is a mandated thing in these areas or across the island. And we, I think that's a very important point to, to kind of rely on because Bermuda has these very strong regulations that have been in existence since 19 how long, right, um, that have forced people to do this sort of water practice. Um, so I wanted to go back to another thing that you had mentioned. Um, what are some of the obstacles to rainwater harvesting? And this can be, you know, a wide spread of obstacles, right? Cost, perceptions around rainwater harvesting, infrastructure, maintenance. What are some of the, the, the hindrances you think to uptake of rainwater harvesting in Jamaica and potentially other islands where it's not being done wide scale? I'll start with you, Shanika. While rainwater harvesting is seen as a solution, a viable option to offset um, the shortfall that we have in our water supply, especially during the dry period, climate change and rainfall variability can be a challenge to that. If we do not have reliable rainfall, then we won't have anything to store, right? As well as the unpredictability of that bimodal rainfall rainfall pattern that I mentioned before um, can become a challenge. If we're not able to predict or set wet and dry season, then we won't know when um, we can we harvest this water. Um, I think, though, that agencies such as the Met Office, the Meteorological Service of Jamaica, and the Water Resources Authority that collect climate data, and even groups like the Climate Studies Group at MONA, they are now in a place where they can provide information on changes in weather and climate that inform decision making about, for example, what, um, what, what's the size of a storage um, that you need in a particular area because of the changes in rainfall that we'll be seeing within that area in the next five or 10 years. And so our decision making about rainwater harvesting will have to be informed by scientific data. Mark? Other obstacle. Um, is the perception. That's, um, I'll say perception. I heard in Sean's presentation, he mentioned some of the water quality challenges that exist with the harvesting of rainwater in Bermuda. And it seems like um, the people of Bermuda are not necessarily bothered by it. But I can tell you, while in rural Jamaica, a lot of people is used to using and drinking rainwater without it being filtered, I think people within our urban areas will be a lot more skeptical about water quality. And I think that will have to be an obstacle. So within the Jamaican context, I think we'll have to have some public health regulations. We'll have to have some monitoring of people's tanks and systems to ensure that from rainwater, people are not getting sick. Over to you, Sean. Um. Um, not sure. Yeah, well, sorry. Omar, I meant, but go ahead, Shad. Uh, um, no, I got a couple of things. I got, I got an interesting study you might like to see on the sizing of tanks and things like that, but um, maybe I'll, I'll send that to you um, offline. Um, Oh, okay, so 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 to the to the question of um what are some of the obstacles hindrances that might um be hindering um Jamaicans from taking up rainwater harvesting? I know for us in the project one of the things that we 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 didn't even think about, but once we rolled out, we realized how aesthetically pleasing, especially for the urban areas, because you are we are asking persons to install rainwater harvesting, and we 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 were thinking it would be something that they would be like, oh yeah, this is making um much more water secure, but they had concerns about how the tanks look, um, how, how does it match their, their, their architecture, so things like that became very important. Um, the, the, the matter of cost as well um, became was an important decision um, 
making factor. But what we were what we were able to do is to work on business and financial case of both the homeowners and developers when they're considering um, installing a rainwater harvesting system. And one of the tools that we now use is a water savings calculator so that homeowners can go and see what it would cost to set up a rainwater harvesting system and over what time period you will get back that investment that you have put in. And that has that has helped to move the, 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 the appetite for rainwater harvesting solutions with the other attendant technologies. Um, so we, we see that um, as well as what Aunt Shanika would have already um, mentioned about the uh, rainfall. Um, persons were very strong. I, I don't get rain in my area, so I, if I'm going to set up a rainwater harvesting system, I'm just wasting money. So, so those are some of the things that we were seeing out of our experience with the water project that hinders persons from taking on rainwater harvesting. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very aware that the chat is very lively. There are a bunch of comments. I want to make sure I leave time for, for Q&A. But I want to end with this question, which is, you know, kind of a big airy fairy question, but I think it's important to think about and to aspire to something, right? So what is your vision for a water secure Jamaica or a water secure Bermuda? Whoever wants to start first. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll go really quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll want to harvesting system works pretty well for based on um one study our tanks are, are generally a bit too large for how much we receive so there's not much we could do um to increase the, the the rain water harvest on people's property we're using uh i think we're using too much uh seawater to produce our drinking water which is very energy intensive um and consequently quite expensive so our, our lenses are, are underexploited. So for me, what I'd like to see is um, much more um, exploitation of our groundwater lenses and reduced reliance on seawater. Yeah. Omar? Okay, so uh, for me, what it would look like is um, every Jamaican, no matter where they reside in Jamaica, having access to safe, reliable, drinking water it's as simple as that every jamaican no matter where they reside on this island of the land of wood and water they have access to reliable safe drinking water Anika? i endorse that 100 percent all right however i have two other visions for jamaica one is closing the water loop I'd love to see a Jamaica where we are not just harvesting rainwater at the household level, but we're going a step further by harvesting urban storm water and the government is utilizing that water. Of course, we will need that to be managed and monitored by agencies like our Water Resources Authority to ensure that there is balance with the amount of water that is harvested between that which is harvested and that which still remains in the environment. I would also like to see us utilizing our gray water. So recycling and reusing some of that water in industry or agriculture would be um, great. And so that water loop now becomes closed where we are harvesting and we're also recycling and reusing water. And I believe that will definitely increase our the amount of water that we have available. Also, I think that we need to update our environmental laws. A lot of our environmental laws are outdated. Um, they have been passed since the 90s. And we see where we, if we do not update those laws, then we cannot adequately protect our watersheds or aquifers and our rivers. And so those would, um, that's my two visions in addition, the third being um, what Amar mentioned with every person having access to safe, sufficient and reliable water supply. Excellent, excellent. I second all of the yeah. things that you just mentioned, right? Um, so and there are a bunch of questions in the chat, hopefully we can get to, to, through all of them. Um, but one of the questions were about housing and zoning laws and how housing and zoning relates to water security and what are, some, what are the type of policies that you're hoping to see or you can be inspired by Bermuda that you think are essential as Kingston and other Caribbean cities are beginning to urbanize and urbanize really quickly and really rapidly. 
So if, if, if I may, one of the things that we did under the water project was to, we have a, we had a water summit um, last year, May, and, and to the question of zoning and zoning laws. And one of the things that we were calling for as a minimum standard with every new housing development going up in Kingston, as a minimum standard to ensure that we are taking into consideration features, fittings and systems to ensure that the water that we are putting in there, we're not just building it and then the water will come, but we are being intentional in how we zone, in how we design the, 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 the buildings, the infrastructure, the house, whatever it is, in a way that we are taking the water needs in mind. And so our laws, do, uh, Shanika would have mentioned the water sector policy. There are some regulations, but they are drafted. Um, so there is there is nothing passed just yet, and it does speak to the, to water security and climate change. But they are draft; they're they're not mm -hmm. yet law. Okay, we have a very interesting question about um, about regulating lawns. So the person is basically saying that lawns and grass in in general consumes a lot of water. If you want to have a very nice lawn, you have to water it on a on a regular basis. Sean, are there any regulations like? I imagine during drought time, are, are, is the government telling people you cannot water your lawn or you have to remove your lawn completely? Uh, uh, no, no, I, don't, I haven't seen any. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen anything from government saying you have to reduce, you have to reduce your water consumption. There's usually um, signs around about if there's water stress, just raising people's awareness. But um, yeah, no, there's, I can't think of a single incident incidents I've been, since I've been here um, and I'm not aware of anything about uh, government cracking down on water use. It's usually just managed, you know, internally because you have I that awareness. True, true. I just want to mention, it was a very interesting question. I do believe that Las Vegas just passed yes. a, a mandate to, yes. <laughs> to ban grass because yes. they're so wonderful. <laughs> wow. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, they, there, are, there are instances that we're seeing now around the world where because of the, the lack of access to water, um, governments, city governments, sometimes national governments, um, the case of South Africa um, was very prominent, I think in 2015, where they were, they, they were at day zero because they were literally running out of water in some parts of South Africa. And the government legislated um, how much water individuals had access to. So we, we don't have that um, in Jamaica. What we do have is the NWC sometimes will say, send out circulars to say, um, we're going to um, lock off, have water lock offs at um, certain periods of time of the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the oh, challenges, Doreen, I just wanted to add to that, is that the monitor is a monitoring and enforcement. If we're going to have a law like that, somebody needs to monitor it and enforce it. And, and we don't have that capacity. And, and, I, and, and I see or maybe it's in our in our far future, but I really don't see it in the near future of Jamaica um, that working. So the law might be there, but I'm not confident that it will be enforced. Mm -hmm. So one person. Just one more, just one more thing to, uh, to, to add to that. So um, yes, um, Shanika, um, the law being enforced, but how enforceable is it? Um, in the context of Jamaica, where we see water as a right okay. that we have. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, ours is, ma ours is um, basically managed at the planning stage. So in the um, a plan for new um, development will obviously include the water tank. Uh, the plans are inspected by Department of Planning. We consult on them, or our, our department consults on things that have any implications for the environment. But then um, the installation of the tank and the, the roof and everything like that, that's all um, checked over by planning um, in order to get a building permit and final sign off. So that's that's how pretty much how it's regulated here, the whole system. Want to mention someone left in the chat um it's a requirement also in antigua for example for buildings to have tank systems installed as a part of the building approval process um sometimes we cannot rely on citizens to act on their own so if we're having stories from other islands about rainwater harvesting also being a part of their system um we have another question about kind of the perceptions around water someone mentioned apart from the study omar mentioned what has been the response from the general public when you engage them in discussions around water efficiency and conservation? So, so the, the general response um, 
to 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 begin with when we say water conservation in people's minds uh what why do i need to conserve water i have water i have it in abundance so you get that initial response but what we have found if it is that we position the messaging at a time where the country or NWC has put out a circular to say that there is a water back off um, between this hour um, on these days, then you find greater receptivity to what we are saying about water conservation. So what we have been doing is working with NWC, looking at those circular and pushing the, the, the message of water conservation when it's fresh in their minds, when they, they, they are feeling the impact of low water access and, and low water availability, no. And then we'll see a change. But also through the pilot project, when we start put the message in terms of the savings that can be occurred to homeowners, householders, if they practice water conservation, then you see greater receptivity. So when we go out and say, there's a possibility that you can save 30% on your water bills, people hear that and they're like, oh, yes, Tell me more. When you start to tell people that, did you know that 80% of your water that you are using at home is in your bathroom and you might have a leak? Um, have you used a leak detection diet to find out? And people find that to be like, okay. So you find that how we how we present the message to them, um, it helps with their receptivity to that message that we're sending them to conserve water. So put, we, 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 we frame it in the, in the, in the context of a, a, a benefit to them. And not only the planet. It is. It is. It is sad, but climate change is not yet um, something that touches um, individual lives, the day to day. So when we bring it in context of how does this affect your day to day life, we we find that persons are more receptive to what we are saying and are more willing to commit to practice water conservation and water use efficiency at home. I'll add to that, Doreen, that you know, it's creating that behavioral change is about education and sensitization. Because while we have the homeowners who will want to reduce their water bill, we still have that subsection of the population that is connected to the water supply illegally or do not have access to pipe water. And so we now have to ensure that we target every single Jamaican with education and sensitization about the value of water and so that they know that this is not something that we will always have. This is something that if we do not take care of our natural resources, then we will be at a point where we are experiencing water scarcity and there will be contestation over the resource between the agricultural sector and for domestic use industry, etc. So I, I think generally, we, as a people, we need to know more about water and some of the challenges that we are to face in the coming years. Thank you. So there are two last questions I want to make sure I leave time for. So one of them, someone mentioned um, that the traditional Bermuda roof, it's limestone cut stone that's there. Um, someone asked, because of the reduction of available limestone, what are some of the other materials that can be used on roofs in replacement of limestone? Or just general, what are the materials that people can use on their roofs if they're interested in setting up a rainwater harvesting system, John? That's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I can't remember, there are, there are there are at least two main types that are used on, on, on the roofs here, uh, artificial slates, and their names completely escaped me, I'm afraid. Um, I'll try and get, I can try and send it um send out the details later maybe but yeah um uh, i know people who have um well usually you still see the the in, in a new build you still see the bermuda limestone so it's still being used um but i know several people who've added extensions and they use artificial um slates in in place um i just can't remember the name of the material i'm afraid Got you. Once you send it out to us, we can, you know, post it on our social media. And then this last question um, is about: Is there are there any plans, either corporate or academic, or, uh, academic across the Caribbean, to develop certification to measure and monitor urban infrastructure, in particular, thinking about water um, regulation? So the person mentioned U.S. has lead. Europeans have well, is there some local alternative, Caribbean specific alternative um, around sustainable building, which would include, of course, sustainable water use? Not that I know of currently. Yeah, not that I know of, not that I know of. 
Yeah, all, all, all I've come across is um, reports mainly from the 1970s and 80s about um, Bermuda's, so all internal government reports. Okay, that's a good question from Tenement Yard Media. Um, but if there are any architects on the chat and you know of any sort of codes, regulations that are Caribbean specific or island specific, um, drop them in the chat. Um, uh, just, to, just to add though, Doreen, so while it is not um, a, a, a national, a national um, code or such, what we have done under the water project is to have a water adaptation guideline um, so we, in Jamaica, we have different regulations, different policies um, around water adaptation and um, water security. So what we have done in the water adaptation guide, and that you can you can find at waterprojectja.com, is to put all of that in one place. So if somebody wants to do a rainwater harvesting system, um, they can they can look to that for the guidelines. If somebody wants to know um, uh, the, the, the toilet, um, what is a water efficient toilet and what should the specifications be, it is in the guidelines. So we've done that under the water project for Jamaica, but it's not, I, I wouldn't say that there is for infrastructure development, something like that, um, not that I know of. Yeah. Um, I know that we are at time and I want to appreciate that people probably have to get back to work, but there's one last burning question that's very spicy in the chat that I had to read out. Um, so <clears throat> someone mentioned that there's a senator, a Jamaican senator um, in charge of water who repeatedly spoke about his, his suggestions of privatizing the water utilities as NWC. So I'm curious about all of you, your, your perceptions about what water security would look like if there is privatization of the water utility, whether you're for it, whether you're against it, and, and what you see being an issue, what, what do you see being the major issues with privatization happening? Shanika, you're laughing, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with that because, you know, privatization is a very contentious issue, especially when we think about water as a social good. So we have water as a social good where, you know, people do have the right to save sufficient um, water supply but then it's an economic good there's a cost attached to the production and the treatment of that water and so if we look at some of the examples of privatizations we see oftentimes that the most vulnerable low-income communities the urban poor they suffer from that type of arrangement because they cannot afford water and so if NWC, which is um, our primary provider of water, is going to be privatized. There has to be mechanisms in place for what we call social water, water being available to those who cannot afford it at um, a minimum cost or um, something, some system being put in place to ensure that every Jamaican has access to reliable water supply. That, that I think you make a really good point there. It's um, when, when, uh, when you have companies making profit, it, it, it is often the you know the the people who are, uh, are less well off that um, don't benefit from it. But I think um, you need a diversity. You need uh, we we have a, a government supplier and a private supplier. The private supplier is actually you know fairly conscious. So I think I, I think they they you know. They do a good job of what they have, but they're exploiting two different types of water. The the, um, the, the private companies relies a lot more on the lens, which requires uh, uh, quite a lot of um, management and, and skill to to make sure that the water that's coming into their plant isn't too salty. Um, so you tend so from that from that perspective, they're actually quite nimble and can respond. So changes and you know maintenance issues and things like that, um, pretty well. So having that private company means probably means that we're exploiting a lot more groundwater than we would otherwise. Um, but they're not supplying the uh, less fortunate to the same extent as government is. So we benefit from having both. Yeah. Well, to that, um, Doreen, that sometimes private um, water supplies, they cherry pick. And so we'll have to know how will we overcome cherry picking because a private um, supplier does not want to supply water to an area where they cannot have a return. 
investment and so regulations um, might have to be put in place to as well to ensure that if we have private suppliers and we do currently have some private suppliers here in Jamaica but on the scale that NWC provides water if we have those private suppliers um, providing water to the population there is no cherry picking. Omar. Uh, so the I, I wonder for that person who asked the question if they were in the sum, the summit last year in May because we did have we did have a, a, a minister which uh he spoke to that issue of privatization of water and there were some there were some very robust discussions that we had around that. Um but I think I I, I fall um in the in my thinking where um Shanika uh, and as well as Sean has um the, uh offered so far. If it is that we're going to privatize, we must realize and recognize that there are uh, some vulnerable populations, some vulnerable groups whom we would have to um, pay attention and focus on because they would be at a disadvantage. Because if you're going to privatize that, 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 that now going to speak to um, those private suppliers um, thinking about profit and not really the, the social aspect of water. And there is a social aspect of, of water. And so if we privatize, we, we, we have to, I think Sean said it, um, a diversity of, of players in, in the field and government still having some part to play just to ensure that the interests of those who might not um, have the voice um, or the resources to access still maintain some level of access to such a precious commodity. So it's not like other things, um, water is life as we are we're discussing now. So we, if we are to go down that route, just to ensure that we have space um, for those vulnerable population to not be excluded. Right. On that note, I think it's a perfect note to end this webinar on. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists, Sean, Shanika, and Omar for um, joining this conversation, participating, all the prep beforehand. Thank you very much. Um, and everyone who showed up and asked, come, asked questions in the chat. Um, and lastly, just as a reminder, what is the Water is Like webinar series is continuing. Um, look out for marketing in the next couple of weeks. Um, the second installment in the series is, all going, is going to be about green versus gray infrastructure. And Shanika kind of alluded to that, prepping up um, the next <laughs> series. Um, we also have a conversation around waste, water, and zoning. So we talked about urban density and densification happening in our cities. That conversation is going to be all about that. And the last one is going to be about urban agriculture, realizing we're in a, a space of, of water scarcity. What does that mean for food systems and food security? Um, so I want to thank everyone again for joining this conversation. The recording will be available in a couple of weeks. We'll be posting it to our Island City Lab YouTube account. Um, and takeaways and all of the, the the clips and bits tidbits from this conversation look out for it on our social media in the next couple of weeks but again thank you all for joining us um enjoy the rest of your tuesday thank you very much thank you lovely to thank speak you. to you guys Take care.